Uh, yes, hello and good afternoon uh, from London. Uh, my name is Anthony Froggart and I'm a Senior Research Fellow and Deputy Director of the Environment and Society Programme here at Chatham House. I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, workshop and public, public discussion on circular economy in the EU and UK taxonomies. Um, this is, event is being co-hosted uh, by our friends and colleagues from E3G. Uh, and is funded by the Lords Foundation. So thank you uh, both for them, for their uh, contributions today. Uh, for the people involved in the workshop, or, or sorry, in, in this first public discussion, there is three ways in which you can be more involved. Uh, firstly, um, your uh, questions and answers. So please do put the questions in the open chat function uh, that you'll see on your platform. Uh, these will be read by the panelists and, and the chair, and they will enable us to, to focus uh, and, and group together questions uh, on key topics. Um, then we have two functions. One is we're anticipating somewhere around 200 people on this call. So please do make good use of the networking function uh, and see who else is in, in the meeting and in the room. And uh, also then there is a, a chat rooms function, uh, which you'll see uh, on the right hand side of your screen, which involves you to create a private room in which you can have discussions. So please do use both of those functions so that it is a more interactive session. In terms of some of the issues uh, that we're wanting to get through today, I mean, I, I think we're all aware the EU is in many sectors a, a world leader in terms of environmental protection and green finance. And it is very clear that the current commission has mandates to take that forward. Uh, and we see that within the legislation, your legislative program that is currently in place. Finance and, and green finance is absolutely essential in terms of the transition to not only a, a net zero, but also a circular net circular economy. Uh, and that is one of the issues that we're here today because green financial taxonomies offer us the opportunity to understand this more and put, more, put in place clear uh, and specific finance for uh, achieving the circular economy. The circular economy is one of the six environmental objectives of the EU, and this means that there is an unprecedented effort to define circular economy, its assets, and, and the project categories. Um, I guess it's important just to consider where we are within the process, the start of an absolutely crucial discussion, and the opportunities that this creates. Um, I work a lot in the energy sector, and what we saw uh, when the ETS was launched, the emissions trading system was launched, it didn't get it quite right at the beginning. Prices were wrong, people didn't quite understand it, but it created carbon literacy. It enabled a much wider sector of society, governments and the private sector, to understand the process by, by which they need to go through in order to start reducing emissions. And I see this very much at, at that stage as helping to in increase circular economy literacy in some ways um, over the, the, the coming weeks and months. And there is clearly opportunities for both the EU and the UK to learn together down this process. So before I hand over to Kate, who will be chairing the next session, I would just like to highlight those people that are staying on for the, the workshop after this. Please do check uh, that you have the workshop agenda on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, and if not, then please do use the chat function to contact uh, the organizers so that they can make sure that you can be re redirected into the next session. So I'm um, really looking forward to it. Uh, and I hand over to Kate. Thank you very much, Anthony. And um, a warm welcome to all participants. Um, we at E3G are really delighted to be working with Chatham House to hold this event today. So my name is Kate Levick. I'm the Associate Director for Sustainable Finance at E3G. Um, E3G is a climate politics think tank which is headquartered in London and the next slide um, gives a few key facts about us. Um, so we work on sustainable finance among other um, issues that are relevant to the climate transition and in the last few years have very closely followed developments around green taxonomies in the EU, um, in the UK and increasingly many other countries. So next slide please. 
So I'd like to welcome you to today's event. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to let you know what the results are from the poll. Um, maybe the results are visible. Um, but in case people can't, I think we have really kind of a perfect bell curve in terms of the expertise that people feel they have on this call so far. 36% um, of people are rating themselves a three out of five in terms of how much they know about green taxonomies. And the vast majority of people are rating themselves either a two or a four. So the purpose of this session before the workshop later is really to look more at the question of taxonomies in general. And I really will be interested to see if we have some different scores as we get to the end of the hour. Um, but I will move on to um, introduce our panel now. We have an absolutely fantastic panel that I think should really help to give us a good discussion today. Um, I'm going to introduce our panellists one by one and each of them will give some introductory remarks um, that will help provide us some background before we get into a Q&A discussion. So I'm going to start with Nathan Fabian. Um, so Nathan is the Chief Responsible Investment Officer at the United Nations Supported Principles for Responsible Investor investment, sorry. Um, the PRI supports over 3,000 institutional investors globally to incorporate environmental, social and governance factors into their investment decisions. And he's been with PRI for five years. But Nathan is also the chair of the European Platform on Sustainable Finance, which is a public and private sector expert panel to develop sustainable finance policies and tools in Europe, including the EU taxonomy. So Nathan, please um, take it away. Thank you, Kate. Hello, everyone. Uh, I will try and help boost uh, your knowledge scores and your confidence scores on, on the taxonomy. It's great to be with you today. If we can go to my first slide, please. I always like to start by saying we now live in a world with explicit environmental goals and objectives. So once upon a time, we could just identify environmental problems, but that's not enough anymore. We know we need clear goals so that we can attend to these environmental problems so that we can make sure that our societies continue to be prosperous, but within our planetary limits. And the EU identified six environmental objectives as the basis of the taxonomy. Climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation received the early attention, but now the platform is developing criteria for objectives three, four, five, and six on this slide. Uh, and of course, Transition to a circular economy is part of that work. And we, in fact, have a live consultation now on our first set of draft criteria. So this is the important thing, clear environmental objectives. And once you have an environmental objective and a goal and it can be measured, then you can start to set criteria around the performance of economic activities. So let's go to the next slide. The taxonomy framework has three elements. In this blue circle, is the idea of substantially contributing to one of the environmental goals on the previous slide. And our main task in the platform and in developing the taxonomy is to work out what a criteria, uh, how it should be designed to identify what a substantial contribution would look like. But recognizing we're in a world with multiple environmental ch challenges and goals, we have this additional concept of do no significant harm. So it's not enough just to contribute one area in one area and do significant harm everywhere else. That would be ultimately counterproductive. And so we've got a framework that contemplates substantial contribution in at least one objective while doing no significant harm to the others. We have this third component called minimum safeguards. Now that was the holding bay for social issues. But as you know, and I'll say in a moment, we're doing some work on a social taxonomy. So this is the current legal framework, three components. Uh, and hopefully most of you will have seen the types of criteria we've been using on climate. And you will have noted that we've always attempted to be science-based. We have said that the criteria will be dynamic over time based on our progress towards the goals, that the market has to be able to use it. And that is companies and investors, so we measure taxonomy alignment in terms of turnover and in terms of capital expenditure and operational expenditure. And ultimately it flows through into company and finance reporting. If we go to the next slide, please. Now, sounds easy uh, to set out this objective, but 
we always find that it's challenging for companies and investors and governments to change what they do now and to meet those goals. And when you set the criteria with the goal in mind, they look extremely challenging. And a company might say, I, I didn't achieve that today. What about all my current assets? What about all my current activities and all the current jobs I provide? And so this question of transition becomes problematic. What we've tried to do with the taxonomy is focus on the very granular performance, the environmental performance of the economic activity. So this fourth uh, item on this slide, the economic activity. But a lot of the argument around transition comes from when people are thinking about the economy as a whole or a company or a financial portfolio. And they're thinking, I'm going to have some old polluting assets, some new clean assets. And there's a, there's a lack of clarity on what the performance levels of the new assets should be. And this is what focusing on economic activities can bring us. Clarity on what the next investment should achieve environmentally. And once you have that clarity with these criteria, you start to lose all these foggy ideas about transition where just a little bit less pollution than today is good enough as part of a transition because we know that just won't work to meet the goals ahead of us. Next slide, please. Now, I've put these same six environmental objectives on one side, and then uh, on the right, these are the types of issues we're considering for social taxonomy. So can we have the same structure if we're trying to contribute to social goals? And arguably, for Europe, they're interested in sustainable finance, sustainable economy. So we need to consider both. So the minimum safeguards approach on social is not going to be enough to direct capital flows to meet these objectives in the market. And so we're designing a social a taxonomy framework. Consultations just closed. The platform is working to resolve the feedback. We'll make recommendations within the next couple of months. If we go to the next slide, please. All right, back to this thorny issue of transition. A lot of companies will say, well, substantially contribute I understand it's hard to achieve. Maybe I can do a little bit of that today. Maybe I can't. Significant harm. All right, I accept that. Being way outside of what the goals tell us and the transition modelling tells us for different economic activities, should we have some intermediate space? Some space where I can demonstrate improvements without being called green or sustainable. And this is what the platform is also working on, this idea of extending the taxonomy. Now, there are pluses and minuses here. Uh, you get more ways for the economy and the companies to recognise themselves, but you increase the reporting burden and you make it a bit harder to use. So at the moment, we're focusing on trying to protect this substantially contribute, this really goal-aligned green idea and examining whether we can provide more categories for, say, mining activities that we know are never going to be biodiversity enhancing, but maybe they can really reduce their impact for example. And maybe there's some examples we can discuss today on circular economy. So that's my introduction. We hope to keep it simple by emphasizing the point that you need clear environmental goals. We set criteria for the environmental performance of economic activities. So we know if they are substantially contributing or they are not, and whether we're going to be able to, uh, to reach those goals that have been set. Thanks, Kate. Thank you very much, Nathan. Um, so now I'd like to introduce Ben Fagan Watson, who's the head of the Green Finance team at Bayes. That's the UK Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. So before working at Bayes, Ben has also held roles at the University of Surrey, at the Policy Studies Institute, at CDP and at Share Action. Hello, guys. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Wonderful. OK, great. Um, apologies, I don't have any slides. Um, I first wanted to give you some wider context of UK government's action. Um, so green finance is a key pillar of the Prime Minister's 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution. Um, and in November 2020, the Chancellor of the Exchequer gave a speech establishing green and sustainable finance as a key part of his vision for the future of UK financial services. Uh, in this speech, he announced the UK's intention to make disclosures aligned with the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures fully mandatory across the economy, becoming the first country in the world to do so. And ahead of COP26, 
which is co-hosted by the UK and taking place in Glasgow this year. The UK is actively pressing for global action on green finance and working to support the development of international standards. At a recent meeting of the G7, the Chancellor succeeded in getting all G7 economies to agree to move towards mandatory climate disclosures. So that's wider context for our work on a taxonomy. So why, why are we working on a taxonomy? Why are we implementing mandatory TCFD disclosures? Information is the lifeblood of financial markets, but market participants don't have access to decision useful information on their relationship between their investments and sustainability, which risks financial instability and insufficient capital flows to hit net zero. The Chancellor announced plans to introduce economy-wide sustainability disclosure requirements for businesses and investment products um, in his Mansion House speech in June. And that will um, require them to report on their impact on climate and the environment and the risks and opportunity that those pose to their businesses. This builds on and streamlines existing sustainability requirements, such as our commitment to economy-wide TCFD reporting. And the government will publish a roadmap setting out its approach to green finance regulation ahead of COP26. In his November 2020 announcement, the Chancellor also announced that the UK will be launching a UK green taxonomy, which uses the UK, e which uses the EU taxonomy as its basis. This will introduce a standard definition of what is considered a sustainable economic activity and require financial services firms and specified real economy firms to provide information about the extent to which their activities are sustainable. This will help clamp down on greenwashing which is unsubstantiated or exaggerated claims that an investment is environmentally friendly and make it easier for investors and consumers to understand how a firm is impacting on the environment. As part of its work on the green taxonomy, the government has launched a green technical advisory group to provide independent non-binding advice on how to effectively implement a green taxonomy in the UK. This group is made up of experts drawn from taxonomy users, academia, science and NGOs. It's chaired by the Green Finance Institute and made up of financial and business stakeholders, taxonomy and data experts, and subject matter experts drawn from academia, NGOs, the Environment Agency, and the Committee on Climate Change. And indeed, Kate Levick sits on it. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, the government will consult on draft technical screening criteria for the, for the taxonomy ahead of making legislation. The government has also established an energy working group, which will provide advice on key technologies such as hydrogen, carbon capture utilization and storage, and how to address nuclear power in the taxonomy, which is a key element of the UK's net zero plans. Uh, we may also establish other uh, expert groups where, where required as work progresses. Now, most importantly for this conversation, the government onshored part of the EU taxonomy legislative framework during the transition period, including the overarching framework of six environmental objectives. The government is required to make technical screening criteria for climate change mitigation and climate adaptation no, no later than the 1st of January 2023. Um, that's obviously our immediate priority and these TSCs will be subject to appropriate open consultation prior to them being made. Um, this government is also required to make technical screening criteria for the remaining four environmental objectives, including circular economy, by no later than the 1st of January 2024. So I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. Um, there's a limit on what we can say about our plans on the taxonomy just yet. As I said, we will be publishing a roadmap uh, before the COP26 climate negotiations, but I really look forward to an informative dis discussion to help shape our policy making. Thanks very much. Brilliant, thanks very much, Ben. And um, yes, it's worth noting that um, as well as my own place on the UK's Green Technical Advisory Group, um, PRI and Climate Bonds Initiative are both represented as well in that group. Which brings me to our next panellist, who is Sean Kidney, um, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Climate Bonds Initiative. Um, so that's an international NGO working to mobilise global capital for climate action. And Sean's also a member of the European Platform on Sustainable Finance. So working with um, CPI and um, the investment and banking community in 30 countries are all aiming to reduce market friction and improve risk differentiation for green investments. And that involves advocacy around standards, issue of support for bond market development and policy interventions that promote green finance solutions, which I think is what we're talking about today. So over to you, Sean. Sean, you may be on mute. 
This is the perennial problem of um, the Zoom era, isn't it? The most common word in the English language now. Um, thanks, Ben, for the invitation to influence UK policy. Very exciting. <laughs> I'm going to talk a bit about background. Um, I'll come to this slide in a minute, but you can delight yourself with the colours in the meantime. We published this last week. You know, the origin of the taxonomy is around a common language. There has not been a common language. One of the differences between ESG, which have multiple methodologies, multiple approaches, risk-based, and what we're talking about is this idea of a common language to what we've got to do, driven by two things, driven by the green bonds market, which has grown up with a common language, and I'll give you some more historical detail in a minute, and driven by the fact that the climate targets we have to achieve, notably the UK's 2030 commitments, are pretty absolute. They're not relative. And ESG has been dominated by a relative approach, best in class, best in approach. And the model doesn't work as well here. You know, coal has to go full stop. Whereas in other measures like hydrogen, there's all sorts of shades of what we have to do. It's a different kind of guidance that's required to make the change. It is essentially a procurement plan for Paris that we have has started this movement. A reason out, as I said, of the, the, the crazily growing green bonds market that's going to, with the help of UK green guilt about to come out, reach close to $2 trillion by its standing this year. So in other words, proof that investors will move if the right kind of tools are given to them has underpinned this idea of taxonomy. Uh, it is about science guidance at a time when, frankly, we haven't had a lot of science guidance coming through. The NDCs, the National Climate Change Plan for being submitted to the, the COP, have been largely along the lines of, oh, that's really bad climate science, what we've got to do. Ah, it's really scary. Um, well, we better do this, hey, but, but what about we just do this? Because I think that's all we can get away with doing. And that's an NDC in most cases. That's unfortunate because, of course, the science continues to be very clear that we have to do. In fact, we have failed to follow the science for 30 years. Hence, the drastic reductions we now have to achieve by 2030 to be able to try and stabilise climate going forward, as distinct from the more levelled reductions that Nick Stern and the Stern Report talked about years ago, assuming we started then. So there's a bit of background of this. Because climate change is happening now, this year has shown it, we need to address resilience. So underpinning the taxonomy discussions history have been mitigation and climate resilience, which the pandemic uh, collapse of biodiversity related incidents shows us is more than just physical resilience. It's also about social and economic resilience. And that gives you one, one of the things I want to come back to in terms of next stages. The, the origins of this, we started working on a taxonomy of the Climate Bonds Institute in 2012. In fact, the work of Nathan Fabian when he was at uh, IGCC at the time on a low carbon registry, which was a guidance for global investors, still being used by many investors around the world, to be pleased to know Nathan, which is based on taxonomy ideas. But the big wins were China. Uh, in the PBOC accepted a recommendation we wrote into a green finance task force in 2014 and created a taxonomy. They called it a green project definitions catalog to underpin their green bond market. It worked. It was more pollution focused. It has become more climate focused in the last year. In other words, it's converging with our thinking in Europe. In 2016, high level expert group on sustainable finance, again, Nathan and I were together on that, recommended. And to our surprise, the commission adopted this idea of a taxonomy to guide investments, but to do more, to not only guide the green bond market, but also to guide disclosure regulation which affects, in the end, thanks to the European Parliament lobbying corporations into the pot too, everyone. Extraordinary. And now we have taxomania. We have countries around the world doing taxonomies. All these coloured bits are countries that are working on taxonomies, from South Africa that has published and will soon finalise their taxonomy, to Chile that is starting to work on the, on the roadmap we wrote for the middle early this year, to um, Kazakhstan, to Russia. A little clue here. The Russian taxonomy will reflect the European taxonomy. Why? Because if the major holders of capital have a set of rule sets, then that rule set guides taxonomy around the world. There's no point in having a taxonomy in Togo, which has no relationship to where capital is, because what you want to do is raise capital. And so linking it back to capital markets has been a key lever to try and establish a science-based approach around the world to taxonomies. And that still keeps being played out. But the Colombian taxonomy, which is about to be published, will reflect the European approach to science-based 
because of that reason. There'll be differences, of course. You know, in Indonesia, it'll be a Baltic coloured taxonomy, but broadly, it'll be in line with what we're talking about in Europe. Now, there's plenty of bits and pieces and to work out in terms of a global approach to harmonisation, compounded by the fact that we were a bit mad in Europe and we've got a, a bunch of Eurocentric stuff which just can't be replicated in, in Indonesia or in Mexico. So there is work to be done to make that part work. But there's a recognition that work is underway. Under the umbrella of the International Platform and Sustainable Finance, Europe, convened by Europe, which, of course, the UK is a member of, we are, have got the first harmonisation project called the Common Ground Taxonomy between China and Europe. We'll be publishing the report on that sometime in the next few weeks, um, the first stage. Uh, Yi Gang, the governor of the Central Bank of China, that's the ministry in charge of the Chinese side of it, says it's going to be 80% consistent with the European one. We're, st we're still getting there, <laughs> but you get the idea. So we will have a kind of word match between the taxonomies that will support other countries with their taxonomy work who want to be aligned with China and Europe. Now, there's lots of geopolitical reasons why both are relevant, particularly in, in Southeast Asia. But the point is, it's a common framework and we have a common approach largely. For example, the Chinese have removed fossil fuel power generation. And there was some in there from the taxonomy to be in line with the thinking of the technical expert group in Europe around fossil fuel power generation. It won't include coal or gas, just to be clear. It doesn't at the moment already. And the idea is that makes that part of the harmonization between the two economies much easier. But in the discussions we've been having around the common ground taxonomy between Europe and China, multiple other countries, members of IPSF, have joined those calls. Japan, for example, has been a regular attendee. They're looking at taxonomy, more voluntary guidance there. Uh, we're working at the moment with central banks in ASEAN on a taxonomy. Some have joined the call. And then, of course, lots of other people are getting briefings in South Africa. It was actually the Carbon Trust in the UK who did the taxonomy draft for them, which is essentially a cut and paste out of the European taxonomy with a few bells and whistles. So this is idea of harmonization is underway. Don't be too panicked about the fragmentation because there's a common approach being used globally. There is work to be done to harmonize, as I've said, but it is broadly a common approach. We need to make sure it's a common approach because those economies that are not capital rich need to get capital from Japan, Europe, and the USA, and they want to avoid speed bumps. Because of course, investors in Europe will be guided by the taxonomy. They can't invest in something that let's say Philippines calls green, which no one else does, in which case there's no point for the Philippines calling it green because it's not going to help them get in capital. You get the idea behind all of this. There, next, we wanted to talk about, there are a few things coming up, apart from harmonization and speed, speed bump removal. There's also new sectors. You've heard Nathan talk about the social, the significant harm section, of course, um, pollution prevention, and of course, circular economy. Now, the reason this is important is twofold. One is this is not a game of finishing something and then going off and having a holiday in Greece. This is an ongoing job. And it will continue because the science will change, especially if we don't meet our climate targets, we're going to have to tighten and toughen some of these transition targets to get to our 2030 goals. Expect a dynamic approach to criteria. No, we'll have to be careful to say it's for future. We were not going to change the past. In other words, an investor isn't blindsided by retrospective changes to their portfolio, all of that sort of stuff. But it is a dynamic approach. That's the first point. The second point is, it is clearly, as you've seen from the European story, more than about mitigation, even though that's the dominant issue initially. I'm going to frame the rest as being about how we act as stewards of our society and our economy and our, and our environments which is the critical argument that we're trying to address in terms of addressing climate change. It's not just about getting emissions down, it's about managing the planet sustainably. And in that context, circular economy is a critical part of it. Now, we're not going to get the circular economy initially because in, in many areas, for example, we've got to build a lot more solar farms and wind farms next 30 years. That is going to require new resources as well, as well as improving circularity within those industries. We're going to have to bring in mining into the sector. Mining of materials that are strategically important to transition will become part of it, subjects of good practices. That will be a next development. Chile is planning to introduce that in their taxonomy that they're starting work on next month. 
in agriculture, not currently covered in the European taxonomy. Colombia has a chapter on it. New Zealand is using the EU taxonomy and adding an agriculture section to it. You can see where it goes. Of course, on the social side of it, we need to be looking very closely at the UN Sustainable Development Goals. For most parts of the emerging market, that is the key guidance for what we would call social. It is also an, a full of indicators of climate resilience. There is a direct correlation between positive outputs around UN SDGs and the greater resilience of a society in a world in the 21st century where everything is going to go bananas and resilience is going to be critical. Last point, we're going to see a link to incentives. We've already seen a substantial link to incentives in China. There's been road testing this idea for five years. For example, cheaper capital at the central bank's liquidity lending window if you post green bonds. But there are many others in China as well. Hungary's introduced incentives for green property bonds already. The Commission's been talking about it. The ECB has got green quantitative easing on their agenda, et cetera. We will see a lot more. We will see incentives, in my view, around trade. Think of this as zero tariffs for zero carbon steel or variations of the kind based on the taxonomy. The taxonomy, a taxonomy, becomes a fundamental platform for collaboration, cooperation and incentives across multiple economies. That's where we're going. And of course, that is why it's really critical that the UK taxonomy is broadly consistent with the other key taxonomies, Europe, China, common ground taxonomy, the US taxonomy that we expect the US Treasury to start working on later this year, won't be called taxonomy because it's got the letters TAX in it. It'll be called something else, but you get the idea. So that's, that's where we're going. The question for the UK is what value can we add in key areas that are not being addressed in other taxonomies? And what value can we add in linking it to further aspects of this revolution in finance that we're currently underway. And that's the conversation I'd like to have with Ben, but maybe after the session. Right, well, thank you very much, Sean. Um, an awful lot in there. Um, it's great to see we've got questions coming through in the Q&A already. Um, and I know some of those are in fact getting picked up already, at least in part by the panelists' remarks, but do continue to ask questions. Um, and we'll answer as many as we get time for, but I do need to give um, the floor to our final panelist. Um, so, Max Tallini is Global Head for Circular Economy at Intesa San Paolo. So with more than 13 years of international banking activity, Max has been involved in different fields spanning from credit analysis to trade finance in the UK, from project finance to innovation in Asia Pacific. He's in charge of the Circular Economy Unit and is also the author of Rethink, which is a documentary about the need to reframe present global business models and the discourse around climate change. So. Max, over to you. If we can try to um, keep it relatively succinct, just in order to make sure we have time for Q and A, that would be great. But we very much want to hear from you. Absolutely, and Kane, thank you so much for this uh, great introduction. And uh, hi to all of you. I think we can just keep to the slide number one, so that we can really keep the conversation going on. As has been said, finance is going to be uh, crucial in the transition in supporting the transition to the circular economy. And as for the first intervention, I would say it's tremendously, tremendously important that the taxonomy is able to, uh, I would say, um, capture the critical role that finance is uh, having and is going to have in making sure that the transition is consistent and is stable for years to, uh, to come. Uh, just a, a quick glimpse of what we have been doing from our side so that we can even have a conversation about why the taxonomy should have uh, a concrete uh, approach and we are proposing something that has been done uh, from our side, as I said. Uh, here there is a six uh, euro credit billion uh, plafond, uh, which is a credit a standard credit facility, which has been designed specifically to support innovative projects that do have circular components. And in doing so, we have been uh, co-designing the, I would say, eligibility criteria with the Element Capital Foundation. You can see in the slides, the first five from your left, the solutions that extend the product life, the utilization of renewable energies, the increase in efficiency, but more importantly, products that can be really composted and innovative technologies are just the broad five criteria that then uh, scroll down also in a more sub criteria. And through this kind of tool, we have been able to support already 4.5 billion projects 
um, uh, since the start of this initiative. Just to say that finance is concretely supporting the transition. And I would personally see uh, very favorable if the taxonomy is able to somehow capture the variety and the consistency of this approach in making sure that other financial institutions can join forces and making sure that this is going to be the case. In terms of uh, the investors, we had the chance back in, uh, in uh, November 19 to issue the very first sustainable bond focus on the circular economy. And again, the offer was uh, 750 million issuance, and we did uh, have uh, a demand which was exceeding the 3.5 billion. Just to, again, uh, emphasize how investors are eager to invest and be a part of the solution in supporting the circular economy transition. And last here, of course, in Italy, but across Europe, you know there is uh, the uh, recovery and resilience facility taking place. And so here as an institution, as the biggest financial institution in Italy and among the top uh, five across Europe, we are supporting the national government to uh, somehow structure the projects uh, along the reconstruction resilience really inspired to the circular economy principles. We can uh, skip to uh, slide number two. And here is just to say that we, that we did want to make sure that we are able to support also the transition from the innovation perspective. This is the key part, to my personal opinion, of what the taxonomy should also encompass in terms of understanding. Circularity does not have too much, um, does not have too much to do only with the waste management. Actually, circularity is really the true passing concept about waste management. Circularity is based on design, on redesign. And design has really has much to do with innovation as well. And that's why we wanted to create a, a, a place, actually a physical one, where we can have a, a sort of interaction in terms of the open innovation approach that can support companies and financiers and institutions and the academy in making sure that uh, there is a, a sort of collaborative approach to uh, find new solutions. And we are seeing very interesting things happening in this space. We can skip to uh, slide number three, where we want to just uh, emphasize a key area of the uh, activity, which is research. Uh, it's been said that uh, science has to be heard and science uh, is to be the basis of upon which we do take our decisions well. At Intesa San Paolo, thanks to the collaboration, strategic one with the Alamecato Foundation and with Bocconi University, we have been also researching the correlation that does exist between uh, a circularity dimension and a de-risking perspective from a financial perspective. So we have been seeing how for a, a company becoming more circular, there is a clear evidence on how the risk and return profile becomes better. And actually the probability of default of the company, both at one year and five year terms is decreasing. So there is also scientific evidence that circular economy is not only important for the environment and it's peculiar. It's of course, it's very key and clear that this is the case, but actually circular economy can really be a game changer also for the financial industry, not just from the environmental perspective. And then with the fourth slide, we just come to the core of the conversation which we do believe should have your input and suggestions. Because of course, here we do see what's happening at the level of the EU taxonomy and also the UK taxonomy harmonization. But just to uh, go back to what I was uh, anticipating in the beginning, for sure, what we do believe, there is uh, much to be considered when we do talk about the taxonomy rather than just uh, uh, contributory significant to the climate agenda or even uh, the um, uh, not doing uh, uh, meaningful harm, which is competitiveness. I mean, we are talking about a strategic agenda. It's a sort of industrial policy agenda. It's not just environment. And again, here we are talking about strategic competitiveness for the uh, industrial system. We are talking about the risking from the financial perspective. And we are talking, of course, about new economic opportunities and value capturing. The company can really size when they do decide to work together in a different way. And again, I think that one point that we can stress is that even in the taxonomy, should be auspicable that even the value, of, value chain approach is taken into consideration. Because to do circular and to make the circular transition happen and stay, we really need cross-industry collaboration. We do need open innovation approach among the players. And in doing so, we are sure that, of course, there are opportunities that can be opened up, but only if entrepreneurs do want to expand 
um, the collaborations among themselves. In terms of course, uh, the um, taxonomies uh, and uh, the exercise that has been just mentioned, for sure, we believe that the um, exercise which is being carried out at European level can be inspirational for other taxonomies worldwide. And be, I mean, from our, from our side, there is, uh, of course, uh, the need to minimize the divergences and making sure that business can really see the taxonomy as, uh, I would say, a tool for increasing its competitiveness way, while at the very same time achieve uh, the climate agenda and making sure that is a positive contribution, not just minimizing the environmental damage, but actually to regenerate the economic, the natural and social, social capital. That's for uh, that's uh, that's all for for me from, from from now. Thank you, Kate. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Max. So the theme of our event today is how the taxonomy relates to the concept of circular economy. And for those who are coming to this with more of a taxonomy expertise um, and less of a circular economy expertise, a circular economy is an economic system that tackles global challenges like climate change, biodiversity loss, waste and pollution. So most linear economy businesses take a natural resource and turn it into a product which is ultimately destined to become waste. But a circular economy employs reuse, sharing, repair, refurbishment, remanufacturing and recycling to create a closed loop system, minimising the use of resource inputs and the creation of waste pollution and carbon emissions. So in that context, I'd be interested to pick up one of the questions that's come through in the Q&A from Holger Barr. Um, Holger has said, I would be interested in your take on the further developments of standards and thresholds to keep the economy environmentally ambitious over time. How do you expect the process of updating or strengthening it to look like with regard to the various environmental objectives? And and I guess I'd like to add my own gloss onto that and just pick up what one or two of the panelists have said. Sean talked about the fact that we would need a dynamic approach to taxonomy over time. And Max has just talked about the need for design and redesign in the context of circular economy. This all makes absolute sense in terms of being led by science. It's also going to be somewhat of a challenge or something a little new, perhaps in the regulatory context. So I'd be interested to hear the panel's thoughts and would like to go to Nathan first on that. Thanks, Kate, and thanks for the question. Uh, the taxonomy regulation anticipates review of criteria on a three yearly cycle. So that's actually part of the planned taxonomy maintenance approach. Of course, what it demands then is capacity to do that. And so you do need to have expert capacity in the environmental objectives, reviewing criteria and being prepared to change them. The idea is that you would assess progress against of, the, of industry against the goals and you'd see if the goals need to be recalibrated. So that's how it will happen on an ongoing cycle over time. Maybe that's a little different to say, bringing in new objectives and new criteria, uh, which should also happen on a regular basis. So if they're Circular economy is interesting because there are multiple dimensions, say durability of product, recyclability, reuse potential. And so what I expect is that we will find that there are additional criteria added for products as products and service change, uh, even within economic activities that are in the taxonomy. Great, thank you, Nathan. Um, Ben, I appreciate it. Maybe early days for the UK, but is there anything you'd like to add on this? Sure. Um, I think it's safe to say that we would absolutely anticipate there being dynamic elements of any taxonomy we put out. Um, if you look at the EU taxonomy that's publicly available, um, there, there is a mixture within the technical screening criteria. So um, some of the, te the technical screening criteria, for example, on climate mitigation contributions of wind power, for example, wind power is classed as green. There's no threshold or anything being updated there. Um, in other areas, there is a specific threshold and that gets updated over time. Um, and as Nathan said, there may be additional elements added in the future. Obviously, I can't say too much about the UK um, approach just yet, but I would anticipate that we would absolutely have some kind of dynamic element to allow us to follow the science. And we're very clear that the UK taxonomy is going to be science-led. Great, thank you very much. Um, so um, another question that um, is certainly in my mind around this, and which Nathan already talked about a little. So to achieve a circular economy, is it sufficient to have a taxonomy that is just having green-only 
activities, ones that set the target for where we need to be. So in the context of climate change, the idea of classifying transition activities and unsustainable activities is often discussed. Um, how can we sort of integrate this concept of transition into the idea of circular economy? And I'd be really interested to hear Max's thoughts on that. Well, from my side, of course, a taxonomy is a, a sort of a, a nice to have and it was also must have in order to harmonize and making sure that there is a sort of common language. And we just understood how crucial uh, is uh, the fact of having a, a common language going forward on a global challenge. Because again, we are talking about circular economy being critically important to achieve the climate goals. But again, I believe that we may miss an opportunity just uh, as Europeans, I would say, if we just confine the attention only to the environmental components the circular economy can bring on. Because actually, as per its own words, circular economy is the new economy. So we really should be focusing on this topic from a comprehensive uh, um, uh, standpoint, with, I would say, also an in policy, an industrial policy and financial perspective to making sure that there is capital which is already supporting this transition making the right decision at the right moment, but with clear direction. And I would say that, uh, I mean, there is already great interest in companies that are able to show their leadership in uh, going uh, even beyond just being green, because circularity, it's even more, I mean, innovative than just being green or even sustainable. What is required, I, I guess, as I said, is for sure a common language, but there is also a clear direction that has to be it's about maintained and shown I would say that for sure, the uh, work that has been done uh, so far, it's great. And there is a strategic opportunity to even reinforce the leadership that we collectively can really express if we make sure that the circular economy is the way forward in terms of uh, industrial policy, financial uh, direction for uh, investments, and for sure, uh, hitting the climate uh, goals and the climate agenda uh, priorities. Okay, great. So I think you're saying you see circular economy as a good framework for guiding how we think of the taxonomy as a whole to an extent. And also, I think I'm hearing you say that you would see some of the social dimensions as being integral to the idea of circular economy. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You can also, so, I mean, if you look about the, the uh, preservation, and I, I mean, we talk about you know, regener regenerative um, uh, practices. I mean, circular economy being regenerative in nature is not just minimizing harmful uh, uh, impacts. We are talking about something which is regenerative. If you talk about something happening in the agricultural sector, for example. So when we look at the dimension uh, that I do personally find really intriguing from the circular economy perspective, I also see, uh, I would say, intergenerational equity because we are preserving access to future generation for access uh, to the natural resources. So again, it's really shifting paradigm, it's really creating a new economy. And that's where I guess the taxonomy should, should really have a comprehensive approach and also an ambitious sort of approach to preserve what the leadership of the Europeans has been so far and also prolong this, uh, making a collective effort, but in the right direction to sustain investments and the industrial uh, policy in the right direction for a, a regenerative kind of uh, uh, industrial system in the future. Great, thank you. Um, so there's a few questions in the chat which are about sort of the international alignment or common ground type um, issues which Sean has talked about. Um, I think, you know, Sean made a very strong case to tell us that, you know, a common approach is already emerging and um, we've heard that the EU ideas are forming the model for so many of the different taxonomies emerging around the world and including forming the basis for the UK. But I think there is a question from Gogo -Go Rose Elo, which is kind of on the money. How can you get the reluctant countries to embrace taxonomy? Sean, I don't know if you'd want to have a go at that one. Well, there's two ways. I mean, but first, let's not try and let's not panic about getting this perfect. At the moment, uh, what we have done on climate is pathetically weak globally. We've got to get the world moving in the right direction. Now, you know, full credit to the UK with its strategies in individual countries. But I remember that emissions in the last 30 years, what well, we put in more in the last 30 years than the previous 150 years, it's not a good key performance indicator. So we need to get things moving in the right direction. So the first thing the taxonomy had is to say, OK, we're not going to make this perfect, but at least let's start defining We've got to go and start pushing capital in that direction. And that applies everywhere around the world. 
The reason for the three-year review is not just the science change, it's just that we've got to get some things better. There are some things that EU taxonomy, I do not agree with because they haven't got it right, but I'd rather get it out there and get it working and we'll keep working on it. And I won't specify what it is, but I'm sure Nathan knows what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> the, the key lever we have globally is not government action, it's the voice of capital. So speaking to Max, for example, you know, if capital agrees with this, and if this taxonomy doesn't work for capital in terms of their risk, yield, or all that, et cetera, et cetera, this is going to be a bit of a failure. But if it does work, they'll them guide where to put their investments in a way that will give them sustainable returns to pay your pension, Kate, in the long run, and also sustainability of the planet, this will work. And everywhere that needs capital will be knocking at the door of the places that have capital. And just think, think in your minds, where has capital? Well, I'm going to tell you now, it is not Kenya. It is not Philippines. It is not Colombia. It's the US and Canada. It's Europe and the UK, and it's Japan, and it's China. If we get alignment amongst those economies, we win. Now, that's what we have to do. So the geopolitical job, which is one of the things why we're doing the common ground taxonomy, is to get alignment on the major economies, the major holders of capital in the world. And then, frankly, it doesn't matter what kind of taxonomy is done in Kenya, because they need to get capital from Europe. Now, they are on the right track, just to be clear. But, you know, bear that in mind. And that's the big lever we have globally in this next stage, because this tra transition we've got to make to a clean, green and resilient and sustainable economy, including all the circular economy measures that need to be instituted, is a CapEx challenge. It's going to be $90 trillion of CapEx, frankly, maybe $100 trillion by 2050. It's a lot of capital. We have the capital, but as I said, note where it is. <coughs> Great. Well, thank you very much, Sean. So um, we are rapidly approaching the end of the hour. So um, I, I think this would be a good time potentially to repost, if it's not up already, the same question that was up before the event. So please do respond to that poll and let us know if that event helped to improve your understanding of green taxonomies. And we'll come back to that in a minute and see what the scores are looking like. Um, so we've had, you know, a as ever, um, a discussion that could have gone on much, much longer today. Um, but I'll just run through some of the key points that we've talked through. And those who are staying on for session two can potentially carry on with some of this in the next session. So, you know, Anthony Froggett started us off by talking about how the ETS um, created sort of carbon literacy among a whole load of new actors and, um, you know, was talking about the potential of circular economy to create new awareness and new practice. I would say the same is true for the concept of taxonomy, which has been a very new concept that has come into the regulatory landscape in the last few years and is still now really only starting to be understood. And I think will have you know, a seismic and impact as the ETS and it's, and it's over time. Um, Nathan you know, talked about how it's incredibly important to have clear goals for an, our environmental objectives, that we need to move on from the defining the problem to finding really measurable outcomes and working towards those. And that's what taxonomy is really all about, is defining those outcomes and where we want to get to. Um, so the EU obviously has done a huge amount of work on this. The UK is catching up and so are a number of other countries. Um, that EU first mover advantage seems to be there in that countries are generally building on what the EU has done or taking it as a model. But there are also developments happening in taxonomies and other geographies where new innovation is happening, um, which will probably feed back and influence the new taxonomy in its turn. So we now have a dynamic global landscape around taxonomy. Um, and we've also talked about the importance of circular economy within this concept and that really leading to the need to think about a stewardship approach and can see a number of comments in the chat by people who you know are caring passionately about issues of resource use resource extraction so shifting to that stewardship approach is absolutely key so max has talked about not you know, not treating this as a regulatory static exercise the importance of renewal redesign innovation i think that's incredibly important to keep in mind this is not the kind of language that we normally are seeing bandied around in the area of financial regulation, but it's extremely important to the development of a taxonomy to be successful. And um, Sean's rounded us off by talking about capital as a 
key lever, the voice of capital, and that it's really important that we get this right and get the right countries involved. Um, and that once that has lined up, we can use that lever to move the world. So that's been a really helpful discussion. Um, we do have now, now have poll results through, and um, I'm pleased to say that we do have a shift. We no longer have a bell curve. 38% um, of people are now rating themselves a four out of five in terms of their expertise in green taxonomies. We've got 44% rating as a five, which I think has gone up a little bit, and a whopping 42% sitting in the middle at three. So that means that um, only, yeah, four fifths of people, more than, more than that, are now feeling as though they're kind of three or above. So I feel very pleased that we have materially moved the level of expertise during this conversation. I'd like to thank all of our panellists for making that possible and for your really, really helpful contributions. Um, so now I think I, my remaining duty is to sort of thank Chatham House for giving us the opportunity to co-host this session and to tell you about what happens next. So for those who came specifically to attend this panel event, we hope you found it insightful um, and you're very welcome to stay on Conference Plus to continue discussions on the chat. Um, for participants who have received a specific invitation to the second part of this event, which is a focused policy dialogue on strengthening and harmonizing circular economy principles, please join the session by clicking the agenda item on the left, and that will open a new window with a Zoom meeting, um, but you do have time to get a drink. So please join that discussion by 20 past two UK time at the latest. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>